TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And with me now, we have first the Assyrian Encyclopedia himself, Sam Shimon. How you doing, Sam? Doing good. Surviving by the grace of Jesus, our Lord. May he be glorified through us in Jesus' name. So, yep. And we also have all the way from the United Kingdom, Hatun Tash. Hatun, how you doing? By God's grace, I am good. Thank you. How are you, David? Good, 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 good. Now, uh, for, for everyone who's watching, we, uh, we are having Muhammad Week here, where we are inviting Muslims on uh, the live stream to join us and have discussions about Muhammad. Now, we have Muslim uh, speakers, um, participants lined up for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday already, but couldn't get, couldn't get final confirmation for anyone for tonight. So uh, I had told everyone ahead of time that if there's a night where we don't have a Muslim, we'll just go ahead and uh, talk about Muhammad anyway. And I had a bunch of requests over the past two days, a bunch for... <laughs> Hatun, Hatun, any idea why everyone wants, a, wants, uh, wants, wants because, you to talk now? <laughs> because, because people look at me and then they see Muhammad. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, so it, it, the, the situation is, the situation is, uh, recently um, some Muslims have gotten a little rough with Hatun on occasion. And I told her I wanted to play the clip. She said, I don't draw attention to those clips. I don't even watch those clips. So she didn't care at all about, uh, about the clips, but I wanted just to, to show, because this does lead into the topic. On the one hand, you have, uh, Islam's treatment of women and very different, very different from the treatment, uh, that most non-Muslims would want to uh, afford to women. But also there's the idea that Hatun is not only a woman, she's an unbeliever. She's an unbeliever. And apart from that, she's an unbeliever who criticizes Islam. So she critiques Islam. She exposes the lies of Islam. And so she's kind of got three strikes against her. And so lots of Muslims just don't feel like they have to be very uh, honorable um, around her. So just to, again, Hatun didn't want, didn't want to go through these clips, but, uh, I just wanted to play just because if I don't, I know I'm going to get a ton of complaints. David, why didn't you show the clips? So, uh, we'll look at these clips real quick. Uh, then we'll use that to, we'll use these clips to introduce the topic. And then for the rest of this program, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about Muhammad's view of women. And it's not very, it's not a very good, uh, good view of women. And um, for since this is Muhammad Week, and since we have invited Muslims to share their views, we'll also take uh, questions and objections on this topic from Muslims along the way. So we should have a pretty action-packed show. But let's go ahead and check out these clips here so people can know what we're talking about. So in this first one, it looks like you were... I, I looked at a little bit of the background, but it was like a three and a half hour live stream video. It's kind of choppy because this was this was uh, this was live streaming on someone's channel, and so that the connection was a little bit choppy at times. But it looks like you had a picture of the Holy Quran, <laughs> so a Quran with holes in it, because this is this is supposed to illustrate um, Yasser Qadi's claim that there are holes in the narrative. And it looks like, it looks like a Muslim got mad and tried to snatch it from you. Is that is that about right? Uh, yeah, I did have two pictures. One of them is Holy Quran with um, Akbar, <laughs> and then other one is uh, I think it was on Friday. Someone in um, Central London draw a picture of uh, Sheikh Yasser Kadi where he stated that there are holes in the account, uh, completion account of the Quran. So someone draw his picture with his statement. Mm -hmm. So I was simply um, trying to engage on that topic. Okay, and so we would all assume that if a Muslim disagreed with you, then he would calmly give his reasons for disagreeing with you, and then he would go on to refute you, but didn't turn out that way. So we'll go ahead and watch a, uh, a short clip here, and here we go. 
Always more. Why did that? Why did that? that? I don't know which one I should be. I have to, I have to, have to say, to, to, say, to, to, say about this, he said. According to what the scholars, Jasir Kadi said that there's holes in the Quranic narrative. Jasir Kadi said that there's holes in the Quranic narrative. What is she saying, bro? What's she saying? This is the most Quran. All right, uh, so that was one clip. Looked like uh, you had some pictures that you brought with you, and um, you brought some pictures to illustrate the Holy Quran and uh, Yasser Qadi's statement, and a Muslim decided that you can't have that, and so he was just going to take it from you. And uh, looks like you ended up uh, being tossed, knocked over there a little bit. All right, and the, the other one, to be fair, to be fair to Ali Dawa. It looks like that was that was his area. That was his area that he was. Was that was that his chair that he was setting up? Uh, yeah. Can I make a comment on the first one or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, so it is not actually fully that Muslims are not appreciative appreciative of art, but it is also uh, they're sensitive about in somehow when it comes to. Uh, Allah and Muhammad. So as as you said, you would expect an individual to just say, okay, explain me what is this or let's talk about it. But it's all about even if it is speaker's corner, it is all about actually my ideology is untouchable. Mm -hmm. And so speaker's corner is unique place where you have freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want to say. Okay, mm -hmm. I can I can call Muhammad names or Muslims can tell me Jesus is not the son of God. They do tell me uh, human beings needed to change the nappy of God. They make lots of fun of Lord Jesus Christ. And I get offended. I get my feelings are being hurt. But in that occasion yesterday, um, speaker's corner is more kind of Sharia corner these days. But um, I was kicked out from speaker's corner. I was banned from speaker's corner yesterday because I offended um, I offended others' comforts at speaker's corner. So it is place of freedom of speech, but still you cannot offend Muslims. So mm -hmm. they are so sensitive the moment they are upset that police kicks you out from speaker's mm -hmm. corner. All right, Hatun, <clears throat> one second. And Hatun, you're, you're, uh, you're sort of kind of off camera here uh, a oh. little bit. Yep, there you go. By yep, the way, hey, Dave. Yeah. What's up? Maybe you tell your mods, there's this guy named Dante Ulchia. He's making fun of Hatun when she's getting beat up. He goes, oh, she's so hot. So he's another low life. Mm -hmm. uh, Dante Ulchia. So yeah, he's block, no uh, block, block whoever Sam is talking about there. If uh, someone's tossing around insults there. Um, yeah, so, yeah, there, there, is this, there is this problem. There is this problem of, uh, as I pointed out, one, there's not a very high view of women in Islam. But also, if you are a non-Muslim, then there's an even lower view of you as a woman. And if you're someone who criticizes Islam, then there is a very, very low view of you. And so kind of doesn't matter what people uh, what people do to you. There's not going to be a problem from an Islamic perspective. Now, in this uh, in this other clip that a bunch of people sent me and asked me to comment on, this looks like it was from a little earlier, but uh, looks like uh, Ali Dawa was setting up uh, something for a discussion and you wanted to have a discussion and so you sat down in the chair was was that it was it something like that not fully so they come to speakers they come to speakers corner to, to critic christian faith there is no good news of islam they can share so they come with the chairs if you want to have conversation with them you sit on the chair and then have conversation so apparently i was told uh, during the lockdown, I put a weight on the moment when they pull the chair when I fall on the floor. It was the problem of gravity. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like kind of anything uh, personal. So it's uh -huh. intentional, but not personal. Yes. So they took the chair and then I fall on the floor. So and and for everyone who's watching, I was a little confused back and way back in the day. This is kind of off topic. But when I heard when I heard people in Great Britain refer to the ground as the floor. 
Uh, oh. it, in, in America, it's a floor if it's inside, but outside we call it the ground. And so I kept hearing people talk about the floor. And so I always thought they were in, they were talking about someplace inside. So a little, little, uh, little side note there on differences in, uh, in language, but we'll, we'll check this out. And so, um, looks like Hatun was sitting down saying, have a discussion with me. And then she got up and then she tried to sit down again tried to sit down in the chair again, and then looks like Ali Dawa pulled the chair out from her. And then uh, what's interesting is uh, an older man was offended and came and uh, uh, touched Ali Dawa, and then Ali Dawa shoved him. And so we'll go ahead and check out this clip, and then we'll move on to our topic. Let's check this out. No one wants to talk to you. Move out the chair, yeah sam i just uh so i saw i saw two things now, now, the muslim response is yeah but she she was trying to sit down in his chair and so it's his property so how how dare she and he and he you know ali dawa pulls the chair out and hatun ends up on the ground uh and then an older man comes up and uh i like that man yeah an older man comes up to try and stand up for for hatun and uh looks like he touches a uh, ali dawa on the shoulder and then ali dawa shoves him a bit harder but and, and and notice here again that's oh but he you know he he pushed Ali Dawa so Ali Dawa can can shove him back Sam I it, it's my view that if you or I did either one of those things with a Muslim woman we Ooh. we would be done completely our careers would be over not not because of the Muslims complaining but because of Christians because oh, Christians yeah. Christians would say how dare you pull a chair out from under a Muslim woman. We don't care. We don't care if it's your. We don't care if it's your chair. That doesn't mean you snatch a chair out from her and and, and uh, let her fall on the ground. Um, if we were to snatch something away from a Muslim woman, if a Muslim woman is sitting there holding a Quran or holding a Bible or something like that, we just said, "Give that to me," and started pulling it away from her. We would be done. Um, and if an an old, let's say, an old Muslim man came up to us and was angry because you know we pulled a chair out from under a Muslim woman. And a guy came along and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" And then we shoved him. It looked like we were ready to we were ready to fight this this old Muslim man. We'd be done. And yet, Ali Dawa is celebrated by Muslims. He's he's their he's their hero for all of this. And so, guys, for those of you who think that there are no real differences between Christianity and Islam, you need to look a little closer at what's going on. It produces very very different behavior. What, what are your thoughts on this, Sam, before we jump into our topic? Well, you're, you're getting a foretaste of what's, gonna, what's it going to be like when Muslims become uppermost. Right now, they're more emboldened in the UK than in America. And notice they're now already harassing non-Muslim women. When they have the upper hand, they'll be raping women, even married women, that's chapter 4, verse 24, which we'll get into, <clears throat> enslaving our children, and doing muta because I hear that Shia Islam is very dominant in the UK. So, folks, this is a foretaste of what David has been saying over the years because he covers jihad more than I do. <clears throat> Remember the three stages? Stage one, you're outnumbered, peaceful. We all worship the same God. You know, to you, your religion, to me, my religion. Second stage, when they have more numbers, oh, you know what? Islamophobia, we are the victims. You are persecuting us. We have a right to attack you. And then stage three, Take the women captive, rape them even if they're married, slice, slice the throats of their men, and enslave their children. So it's coming. Until Jesus Christ returns, it's coming. So you're getting a foretaste. All right. And uh, Hatun, any, any more thoughts on Speaker's Corner um, and how Christians or, or Christian women are treated at Speaker's Corner before we jump into our topic? Uh, so I don't have... It is sad. It is sad. But I don't have much high expectations from... Uh, Islamic Dawah team or Muslims at Speaker's Corner because uh, some addressed and then you also pointed out a ideology which teaches that men can be their wife ideology which encourages uh, prostitution ideology encourages sex slaves like lying all those kind of things um, and identifies me worst of creatures mm -hmm. and 
I critique Islam, I don't have much high expectations. So uh, for me, it is shame that it takes a place in a play, beautiful place where freedom of speech is supposed to be practiced, like the way if you look at history, people give up their life, all those kind of things. But when this ideology teaches someone, oh, yeah, they can beat their wife, they can do these things to their wives. And I'm not even their wife. I'm just a Christian who's critiquing Islam. So I'm not expecting them to put the roses or flowers for me. And I think it will be very dangerous, actually, if every time I turn up the speaker's corner and they are simply giving me roses because I critique Islam. I think that will be so um, weird. But um, yeah, when people don't know Jesus, they just expresses how much they are hungry for Jesus. Um, you just kind of get on with those things. I said, like, I don't bring attention to those things because my main purpose is those people, they don't know Jesus. And people are dying without not knowing Jesus. That's my focus. Yes, people will insult you, bully you, attack you, but you fix your eyes on Christ and Lord deals with them when the time comes. Uh, I'll just do my best to use the opportunities to preach Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's kind of that's kind of my feeling on uh, like people ask me what David, why don't you report all these death threats to the uh, FBI and so on? It's like, uh, well, well, one, I, I I get it, I know I know why they're doing it. I knew what I was getting into when I started criticizing Islam. And two, gosh, if I spent my time like reporting all of this and having to go to court and try to have people arrested over this stuff, I'd never have any time to do anything else. Yeah. I'd never have any time to <laughs> exactly. do the, the stuff that I'm actually interested in. And so uh, awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Now, we did have a, a question here, and this actually leads into our topic of the day. We're talking about Muhammad's view of women. And Kay Scott here asked a question. What is muta? So... Uh -huh. um, Hatun, yes, yes. Hatun, you want to tell uh, Kay here what muta is, and and just so you know, Kay, if you're looking up that spelling, it would normally be it would normally be with a U. Um, so if you're looking it up, but uh, Hatun, what is muta? Actually, I'm gonna write a song about it because since yesterday, I we put a song together where it says Allah is a false god. So I'm gonna make one about muta. Muta is. Uh, kind of temporary marriage between a Muslim and between men and women. It is from three hours to goes up to like 99 years. But the purpose of it is you set up the time, you decide the money, and intention is you pay the a woman for the pleasure you received from that sex. Um, in England, it is practiced. Uh, you do have mosques, um, mainly Shia mosques, to practice it. And um, the background of this comes from Surah 4, verse 24. Um, <laughs> Sunni Muslims uh, kind of practice that under the different names, Misya marriage or those kind of things. But as I said, it is you marry with, you have sex with someone under the label of marriage, like from three minutes, even it can be three minutes, to goes up the as long as you want and you pay them wonderful it doesn't it's not prostitute it, it is not prostitution because uh you identify that as a uh, marriage and man gives you a kind of money and then you decide at the time even we have a video is from speakers going where muslims are offering me money for muta so hmm. yeah by the way, Dave, let me explain Misyar, because you mentioned Misyar, the uh, <clears throat> Sunni equivalent. A lot of people have heard of Muta, they have not heard of Misyar. M most Christians may not be aware, Muta is still practiced by Shia. The Shia Muslims say this practice called Muta <clears throat> has not been abrogated. But then you have the Sunni Muslims who say that there are reports that say it's been abrogated, canceled out. So guess what the Sunnis did? They came up with something called misyar. Now, there are Sunnis who condemn it. Now, let me explain the difference between misyar and muta. Misyar is, I'm going to marry this woman with the intention of divorcing her maybe three months from now, a year from now, but I will never tell her that's my intention. I won't tell her mm -hmm. I'm marrying you only to divorce you. I'll marry her, deceive her into thinking that I want to remain with her, but I'm going to be marrying her for maybe a year, two years, three years, and then I'll dump her. Now, maybe during that course, I fall in love with her and I don't. 
That's the difference. So, guys, you see how tricky the yep. Sunnis are. Yep. Caesar, whereas, look at the trick, right? Whereas, whereas the the Muta we read about during the time of of Muta, as we read about in the time of Muhammad, that's more. You're, the woman is aware of it. You're saying, "Hey, here's going to be a contract. I'm going to marry you for three hours. I'm going to give you this much money, and then we're going to be married for three hours." And so. Obviously, obviously, obviously a form of prostitution, but it's not viewed as prostitution because you're married. You're just agreeing to marry the woman for three hours or three days or something like that. Uh, now, now there is the objection that often comes. So it's basically uh, kind of two things. One, that, uh, you know, that, hey, this is just a, a Shia practice, whereas we read about it in, in Sunni sources. Um, so two, there, even for Sunnis who believe that it was forbidden they have to believe that it was at one time allowed, right? Because this was during the time of Muhammad and, and they, um, they believe that this was allowed for a time during the rule of Muhammad, but that Muhammad eventually forbade it. But uh, Sam, it, it seems yes. to me that a Sunni, given his sources, could decide either way because they have hadiths that say that it was allowed by Muhammad and it wasn't yep. Muhammad who forbade it. It was later Muslim leaders exactly. who forbade it. And then they, those later Muslims rewrote history to, to claim that Muhammad forbade the practice. Whereas other hadiths say, no, it was Muhammad that forbade the practice. And they're both in the same collections of hadith. So it seems that a, a Muslim can basically decide if he wants to condemn Mutta, he can say, ah, but here's where Muhammad forbade the practice, even though he allowed it for a while. But if they want to practice Mutta, and I'm saying this because we know we know this keeps happening because uh, during the, the Syrian refugee crisis and so on, I kept reading articles about wealthy Saudis who are Sunnis going and practicing Mutta, going and marrying these you know teenage Syrian refugee girls who have no, no form of income for their families, going and marrying them for three days, a week, something like that. In order to have sex with have sex with these young girls, so um, are the are even the Sunni sources yeah. inconsistent on this point? Oh yeah, I'm going to read Sahih Muslim. Lest if I went to Tabari, they'll say, "Well, Tabari narrates weak narrations." Watch this, guys. <clears throat> Sunnis will tell you Muhammad abrogated it, and you can find statements ironically attributed to Ali. Lo and behold, look who it's attributed to uh, they, uh, to Ali because. You see that they concocted this to silence the Shia who follow Ali. But anyway, here's Sahih Muslim, book 8, number 3248 in English. Sahih Muslim, book 8, number 3248. Did Muhammad abrogate it? Well, let's read it. Ibn Uraj reported, Atiyah reported that Jabir bin Abdullah came to perform Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. And we came to his abode, and the people asked him about different things. And then they made a mention of temporary marriage, muta, whereupon he said, Yes, we had been benefiting ourselves by this temporary marriage during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet and during the time of Abu Bakr and Omar. So they were still doing muta up until the reign of Omar, Omar ibn al-Khattab, years after Muhammad's death. In fact, it would have been probably two years after Muhammad's death because Abu Bakr was caliph for two years. So even in the reign of Omar, they were performing muta. There's a tradition in Tabari that says that Omar abrogated it but then when someone complained he reinstated it mm. so there you go say muslim so as as is pretty much always the case the muslim sources are so hopelessly contradictory that a modern muslim can decide ahead of time whatever he wants to believe and then go find those sources to support whatever it is he wants to do and whatever it is he wants to believe yep interesting now guys i just wanted to read um one message i got on this topic from a former prostitute Oh, wow. uh, and then we'll get uh, any final thoughts Hatun has on this issue, and then we'll move on to the next topic. But uh, w one day I posted, and what did I post? Let me see. This was, no, I just posted a, a an article on my blog several years ago and posted an article basically showing what Muslim sources say about muta and showing that, no, you, you have Shias who still believe that it's allowed, and you still you have Sunnis who still believe it's allowed, and then you have Sunnis who would just, you know, do something similar and call it by a different name. But I got a message from a woman who said, muta is 100% true. I know this for a fact, my very own self. Before I, before I repented and gave my life to Jesus, I lived a very sinful life. I was an addict and sold myself to support the ha to support my habit on the streets of Bankstown, Sydney, Australia. The majority of my clientele were Muslim men. The wow. unmarried ones, the unmarried ones would ask me to repeat some words in Arabic after them, which was basically me agreeing to marry them for however many 
for however many minutes I agreed to give them in sexual service for the amount of money I agreed to charge them. They would even look at their watch for the exact time, even if we finished in one or two minutes, which was always the case. If the agreement was for 30 minutes, I would have to sit out the remainder of the marriage. Then once that 30 minutes was up, we were instantly divorced. I jump out of the car and proceed to get married several more times that night to other Muslim wow. men. Also, so many married men with married with children uh, make up the majority of my clientele in the street sex work industry in the Bankstown area. I just wanted to confirm Mutta is very real and still happening today in Western countries. I thank my Lord Jesus Christ for saving Hallelujah. me, for saving Hallelujah. me and making me a new creation. Praise God. Father, Holy Spirit, thank you, awesome Lord comment. Jesus. Any Jesus. final thoughts yeah. on the issue of Mutta, Hatun? Thank you. Um, so uh, you can get that in Sh um, Sheffield in England as well. We do have ex-Muslim, um, where uh, she was married uh, for Muta marriage a couple of times. It is sad, it is ugly, but Allah, with all of his wisdom, who is showing lots of mercy and kind to humanity, thinks, yeah, you can use the institution of marriage for five minutes to ten hours in the intention of just making money and meeting up with man's desire. I think it's double ugly. Yeah, and, and for again, for everyone who's watching, keep in mind, even though you still have this as a Shia practice, even among the Sunni Muslims who just want to reject any of this and say, nope, all of this is forbidden, they still have to believe that Muhammad allowed that for a time. Muhammad allowed his followers to do that for a time and then eventually changed his mind about the practice. So what we just read about there... These, uh, these young women uh, selling themselves to Muslim men, agreeing to be married for a certain amount of time, that we find that over and over and over again in the Muslim sources with the approval of God's final prophet, Muhammad, saying, yes, this is, this is, a, this is a blessing. And, and, and Sam, uh, we, we've pointed this out many times. According to Muhammad, this is ordained by Allah in the Quran, is it not? Yes. In fact, in Sahih Bukhari, it says that she mentioned chapter 4, verse 24. In Sahih Bukhari, it's mentioned that chapter 5, verse 87, Surah al maida 87, yeah. was revealed for <clears throat> permitting uh, muta. Do not deny yourselves the pleasures that Allah has made lawful for you. That's chapter 5, verse 87. That's in Sahih Bukhari. So when you, my challenge to the Muslims is, do you believe the Hadith of Muhammad can abrogate the Quran? Now, here's what's trickier. There are some Muslims who say, yes, Muhammad's Sunnah can abrogate a command in the Quran if it's multiply attested, mutawatir. It has the st status of equ equal authority of the Quran. Isn't it ironic, folks? The Quran is supposed to be the perfect, uncreated speech of Allah, flawless and perfect. Chapter 5, verse 87, supposedly was sent down to justify muta. And then Muhammad comes and with his narration abrogates this eternal command, even though there is no verse in the Quran that abrogates it. Muhammad comes and he abrogates it. But even in the Hadith, it's not clear whether he did, because there are Hadiths that say it hasn't been abrogated. It was actually being observed under the time of Omar, and I have the reference from Tabari, that says, when they complained to Omar, you rescinded something that was made lawful to us, then Muhammad reinstated, I'm sorry, Omar reinstated it. So then if that's true, it's Omar who abrogated it, reinstated it, and then chapter 5, verse 87 says, Do not deny yourselves the pleasures that Allah has made lawful for you. That means from a Sunni perspective, you can make a strong case. It is still something you can observe till this day. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, along those lines of how Muslim men are allowed to use women for purely sexual purposes, let's turn our attention to the treatment of uh, captives and slave girls in Islam. And guys, uh, I'll probably point this uh, to you, to all those of you who are watching, I'll probably point this out multiple times. I just want to be clear. When we're talking about what Islam teaches, we're not talking about what all Muslims do. You'll have many Muslims who are just as horrified as the, uh, at this information that we're reading uh, as we are, right? You'll find Muslims who live far better lives than their prophet and are just as horrified as what we at what we read in the Muslim sources as we are. So just be clear, just to be clear, when we're talking about these sources, we don't mean, hey, here's what every Muslim is doing. We don't mean that at all. Um, 
So ju I just wanted to be clear on that. When we're talking about Islam now, we're talking about what Islam teaches. There will be Muslims who follow these things. There will be Muslims who don't follow those follow these things. But on this issue, um, Hatun, uh, female captives, what can... So you, you basically have a couple of ways you can end up with a captive or slave girl. You could buy a slave girl. Someone could give you a slave girl. You can inherit a slave girl. Or you can capture a woman in battle. So you go out there, you conquer the town, you kill the men, you take the, the women and girls as your captives and they're now your property according to Islam. How can you treat those women and girls according to Islam? I would love to say you simply sit down and have have a cup of hot chocolate and discuss what where to move from this and what to do. But sadly, no, they are your kind of eternal slaves and you can do to them whatever you want to do. They are there to just please you. And one of the examples is just we look at even like before going to 14th century ago, um, we just look at what ISIS to our sisters or Yazidis when they take the uh, them uh, and use them again and again to rape them and just for their pleasure you go back to uh, you go back to, again this country Saudi Arabia uh, Lebanon and Jordan the maids who comes to work in the house of Muslims they are used for sexual pleasure of um, house um, landlord as well as even for the sexual pleasure of the child of the house that's a 21st century in the time of Muhammad it was the same so you take those um, girls captive or those females as captive and you just meet um, they are just there to meet up with your sexual desire and then you just pass them around I think that's a uh, peaceful religion of Islam mm -hmm. very much peaceful all right now, now Sam. Um, yes. What uh, in the in the history of Islam? So mm -hmm. it, it, early on, the Quran, Allah revealed in the Quran that when you capture a woman in battle, yep. that she is your sexual property. You can have sex with her, her in addition to your wife. So you have your captives right. and slave girls, those whom your right hands possess. You have those and you have your wives. Those are the ones, those are the ones you're allowed to have sex with. Uh, nice. But early on, it was that teaching arose in situations where the Muslim men had slaughtered the unbelieving men in battle, and then only the, the women were left over. And then so they yeah. would take these women as their their captives and slave girls, and they were they knew they were allowed to have sex with them, but there eventually arose a situation where Muslims captured both the men and the women. And so the men and the women were captured. So the women mm -hmm. and their husbands were captured. And so these women were married. These women were married. And Muhammad's followers came to him because they were concerned. They know that they're allowed to uh, seize these women and have sex with them. But they also know they're not supposed to have sex with married women. And so we need to go check with Muhammad because we need Allah's opinion on this. We need to verify that, you know, what we don't know what we're supposed to do. And so what what did Allah reveal in yeah. response to all of this? Yeah, and just side note to confirm, you have a Muslim here, Akhan. I just posted his comment. Look what he says. Hatun is a female captive. That's a Muslim. You see mm -hmm. the spirit of Islam shining through? Akhan mm -hmm. just said, Hatun is a female captive. See the spirit of Islam shining through? Now, to answer your question, the verse that was sent down to Muhammad, the agent of the devil, to justify, now this is what we call rape, raping of married woman and unmarried woman, because I don't know of any sane, moral woman that would gladly sleep and have sex with her captors after slaughtering her village or city or town. But here it is, <clears throat> I'm gonna read two, one that talks about married captives, Sunan Abu Dawud, <clears throat> Sunan Abu Dawud, Volume 2, number 2150. Now, by the way, folks, <clears throat> all these hadiths you can read online for free by going to this website called sunnah.com, S-U-N-N-A-H.com. They're now even uploading the English translation of Musnad <clears throat> Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Now, I'll talk about that later, but just go there. It's a beautiful resource. All the major hadith collections for free. Download them before 
the site goes defunct. So all of this is there for free. Sunan Abu Dawood, volume two, number 2150. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri said, the Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Autas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captive. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So notice, they had more moral integrity than Muhammad and Allah because they saw a woman, she's a captive, but her husband's alive. How dare we touch her? You know, that's adultery, right? We're, we're already raping the female captives, but adultery on top of it? So Allah, the exalted, sent down the chronic verse, chapter 4, verse 24. And all married women are forbidden unto you, save those whom your right hands possess. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period to make sure they're not pregnant. So guys, ask a Muslim, can you tell me why chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran was revealed when it says, unlawful for you are married women except those whom your right hands possess? Most Muslims won't know, and those Muslims who do know will be embarrassed by telling you the historical context. Allah and His Messenger sanction raping women that you've taken captive and even married women because they're your property and who cares about their infidel husbands, their dogs anyway, the worst of creatures. Now let me just read one more hadith because I want you to see how dirty Muhammad is. Sahih Muslim, this is again now Sahih Muslim, book 8, number 3371. Sahih Muslim, book 8, number 3371. Watch how dirty this man is. Abu Sirma said to Abu Sayyid al-Khadri, same gentleman, O oh, Abu Sayyid, did you hear Allah's Messenger mentioning Al-Azil? Azil, and I'll, I'll explain what it is in a minute. He said, yes, and added, we went with Allah's Messenger on the expedition to Bil Mustalliq and took captive some excellent Arab women, almost describing like you'd say an excellent horse. Look at that horse, it's so excellent, right? And there's a verse that actually relegates women to the status of horses, chapter 3, verse 14 of the Quran. Some excellent Arab women, and we desired them. We were suffering from the absence of our wives. So we're burning with lust, and Allah is completely impotent and powerless to give us self-control. So he lets us become sexual perverts and deviants like his messenger. But anyway, that's my commentary. And we desired them. We were suffering from the absence of our wives. But at the same time, we also desired ransom for them. Now, let me explain for people who don't understand this. When they took captives, they'd either murder them or take them as slaves if they're women and children or sell them. In other words, they would say, hey, we got your daughter. How much are you willing to pay for her ransom? So I capture a woman. I say, hey, dad and mom, we got your daughter. We want $50,000. So notice what they're saying here. We want to ransom the women and get money back, but we want to have sex with them. But we're afraid. What if we get them pregnant? Notice the logic of Allah and His Messenger. How to solve this dilemma? How do you solve the dilemma, Allah and His Messenger? These men want to get ransom for these women, but they're so beautiful, they want to now have sex with them, but they're scared. What if we get them pregnant? So we're going to perform al-azil. What's al-azil? Let's keep reading. So we decided to have sexual intercourse with them, but by observing azil. Now, in parentheses, the translator explains what it is. Withdrawing the male sexual organ before emission of semen to avoid conception. Pulling out, in other words. Sorry about that, but this is Islam. You have to be filthy. But we said, we are doing an act, whereas Allah's messenger is amongst us. Why not ask him? So we asked Allah's messenger, and he said, it does not matter if you do not do it. For every soul that is to be born up to the day of resurrection will be born. So notice Muhammad says, do it, you don't do it, doesn't matter. Because if you're going to get her pregnant, it's predestined by Allah. Now notice how perverted Muhammad is. He doesn't say, hey, what do you mean having sex with them? Shame on you. They are women created in the image of God. You've already taken them captive. Don't you dare defile them as pieces of meat. No, hey, it's okay. You want to pull out? You don't pull. It's all right. It's all Allah because Allah, Qadr, predestination. That's how filthy this religion is. All right. And uh, we do have a situation that can arise in Islam. Um, if you as a Muslim man understand that you're allowed to have sex with your captives and slave girls and you decide to take advantage of this privilege in Islam and decide to have sex with your captives and slave girls, this might upset your wives. Your wives 
might be a little offended at this, right? So your wives might be thinking, and you, you women who are who are uh, in the in the chat, uh, even you Muslim women who are in the chat, you can imagine if your husband married you and maybe a few others, um, up to four, unless you're Muhammad, in which case you get you get far more. But if your husband married you and some other women, and then in a, you, you're basically not enough for him, and he also has to have sex with his slave girls. You can imagine a situation where your husband, where you go out to the market, you come home and find your husband in bed with his slave girl in your bed. And this might actually upset you. And so you might complain and notice, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you know, you can complain to your husband and say, hey, this is really, really bothering us. Uh, Hatun, is, is this something? Is this something that has come up at some point in the history of Muhammad? Uh, yeah, Surah 66, where um, one of the wives of Muhammad, also who, who is daughter to Umar, comes home and sees Muhammad is sleeping, not sleeping actually, in the action of sex in Hafsa's bed with someone who is not Hafsa. Mm -hmm. So it is Hafsa's bed and in her bed, her husband, who has got already lots of wives, but not one of those wives. She is identified one of the uh, sex slaves, um, mm -hmm. Coptic, married a Coptic girl. Um, Hafsa sees her and Hafsa expresses, that's just wrong, my lovely husband. You can't do that to me. What happened to the, our marriage covenant? Once uh, we become one for um, until we die, uh, of course, that is the time Muhammad says, ah, I'm so sorry, Habibi, please do forgive me. Uh, and I will never do it again, but he's got so much self-control, he see, he does it again, and this time Allah steps in, and then Allah says, oh, well, why, like, why are you saying, no, I'm not going to do it, just go for it. Mm -hmm. That's Surah 66. Mm -hmm. So it does happen in the history and lifetime of Muhammad. It's just kind of question, of, he's got already lots of wives, like, why would you even need another yeah. plus like why would you use your wife's bed what like couldn't you wait like she comes and then catches her in action you just like mm. couldn't you wait for one more minute but anyway i'm not gonna go to yeah. that yeah yeah there, yeah there, there are a couple there are a couple things here um well, notice what 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 to do uh, what Hatu just pointed out right what, why does it have to be in hafsa's bed why is he having sex with his slave girl in his wife hafsa's bed i mean if you're a woman Assuming, I mean, assuming you are a really, really devout Muslim woman who respects Muhammad and wants to believe that everything, you know, that, that he commands is okay. And so, yep, if he's commanded that, you know, he can break the four wife limit and he can have nine wives at once or 11 wives at once or whatever he wants to have, that's all fine. And in addition to that, he's allowed to have sex with the captives of his right hand. Um, in addition to all that, I mean, can't, does it have to be in my bed? I mean, so mm -hmm. just imagine you're you're a Muslim woman in that situation. You come home, catch Muhammad in your bed with his slave girl. You want to sleep in that bed? I mean, you want to you want to you want to sleep in that bed where Muhammad just he just got off his slave girl, and now yeah. you have to lay down in that in that bed. We know that he was not a fan, a big fan of baths, and that he would have sex with nine women and girls. Uh, in a in one night, but only take one bath. So I mean, can you imagine what this bed is going to smell like, dude? Go somewhere else. Yeah. Go to a different <laughs> bed. Go somewhere else, yeah. dude. Stay out of my stuff. But no, Muhammad has to has to uh, go to her bed. And um, uh, let let me go ahead and read the sources that that Hatun was talking about. So, Surah sixty six verses one to two. Allah says, "O Prophet, why do you forbid yourself that which Allah?" has made lawful for you. You seek to please your wives, and Allah is forgiving, merciful. Allah indeed has sanctioned for you the expiation of your oaths, so you're allowed to cancel your oaths, and Allah is your protector, and he is knowing the wise. So uh, this, is, this is Allah's response to Muhammad saying, okay, okay, Hafsa, okay, Aisha, I understand you're upset that I was caught having sex with my slave girl in Hafsa's bed. I'm not going to have sex with that slave girl anymore. And then Allah jumps in there and says, whoa, how dare you say that you're not going to keep having sex with that slave girl? I didn't tell you to make that oath to your wives. So you can go ahead and break that oath to your wives. 
And there's no problem here because I didn't tell you to say that. And so this is a very strange view of oaths, right? Because generally when we make an oath, usually it's not God telling us to make the oath. And so that's what Allah is saying here. I didn't tell you to make that oath, so go ahead and break it. And so the very, very strange view of oaths. But just, just for everyone, let me give you two commentaries um, on this. This is uh, Tafsir Jalalain on the two verses we just read. Surah 66, verses 1 to 2. Uh, o Prophet, why do you prohibit what God has made lawful for you in terms of your Coptic handmaiden, Maria, when he lay with her in the house of Hafsa, who had been away, but who, upon returning and finding out, became upset by the fact that this had taken place in her own house and on her own bed by saying, she is unlawful for me. So this is Muhammad's response. Okay, I declare that, that, that Mary the Copt is unlawful. Seeking by making her unlawful to please your wives... And Allah is forgiving, merciful, having forgiven you this prohibition. And then, of course, Sunan Anasai 3411, it was narrated from Anas that the Messenger of Allah had a female slave with whom he had intercourse. But Aisha and Hafsa would not leave him alone until he said that she was forbidden for him. Then Allah, the mighty and sublime, revealed, O Prophet, why do you forbid for yourself that which Allah has allowed to you? until the end of the verse. So this is everything we're saying right here is directly from Islam's most trusted sources. Now, now Sam, going back to something that you mentioned, you mentioned that, um, you know, Muhammad was out waging his campaign with his army and his followers would come to him. Oh, we're a long way from our wives. What do we do? Oh, okay, you can hire prostitutes. Oh, but you know, we're a long way from our wives and we have these female captives, but we want to sell them and we don't want to get them pregnant. And notice the response is never, well, control yourself. Never, yeah. The response is never, ever, ever, guys, control yourselves. Be men and have some self-control, right? Yes, we know you're going to be away from your wife, wife for two weeks while you're, while you're going out fighting battles. Have some freaking self-control <laughs> for, yeah. for two weeks. Can you do that for two weeks for your prophet, for your God? Can you have self-control for two weeks? And they're going, no, we need to hire prostitutes. No, we need to rape these captives. But we're scared of raping these captives, even though they're, they're, you know, they're still married because their husbands are here. But we're scared because we want to sell them in the next town and we don't want them to be pregnant. What do we do? What do we do? It's The answer is never self-control. And even with Muhammad, Muhammad, you've got nine wives to choose from. Some of the most beautiful women in Arabia are yours to use as you see fit. What else? What is that? Not enough? No, I need more. It's never Muhammad. Come on, control yourself here. It's it's just not. It just doesn't exist in in Islam. Yeah. So, uh, Sam, final thoughts on on any of these yeah, things wanna, before we move on. I want to discuss people even worse with chapter sixty six because people don't understand. Guys, it's only twelve verses. Christians, I want you to be disgusted. Are you ready? Really get disgusted and really upset to the point it's blasphemy and this man deserves to be in hell. If you read chapter sixty six verses one to twelve, read it carefully. Muhammad's God threatens the wives that Muhammad will divorce you and mm. Allah will replace you with better wives. And then Muhammad, his God, gives examples. He gives examples of two rebellious wives whom Allah destroyed. The wife of Noah and the wife of Lot. And so there, it's in all in that chapter. It's only 12 verses, 66. There, Muhammad's God is saying, look, you see what happened to Noah's wife? You see what happened to Lot's wife? That's what's going to happen to you. And then he gives the example of two godly women, a virgin and someone that was married to a pagan. The wife of Pharaoh, which tradition says her name was Asiya, and Mary, the daughter of Imran. So look what the, the chapter is doing. Here's a, con here's a contrast of two godless women whom Allah destroyed and two godly women whom Allah has honored and glorified. See, if you act like these godless women, Allah will destroy you. But if you're godly like this woman, Women, Allah will honor you. But guess what, folks? You just really want to get disgusted? I'm going to read a tradition. This comes from a Muslima. Her name is Alia Schleifer. She wrote a book, Mary, the Blessed Virgin of Islam. Mary, the Blessed Virgin of Islam. Page 64, she's quoting Ibn Kathir, Qisas uh, al-Anbiya, the story of the prophets. Qisas al-Anbiya page 381. According to Ibn Kathir, there's a tradition that says this. Christians get ready to hate this man even more and thank God that he's now under the wrath of Jesus Christ. The messenger of God said, the messenger of Allah said, Allah married me in paradise 
to marry the daughter of Imran. In other words, Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, will be honored to become one of the wives of Muhammad and Jannah. God forbid such blasphemy. Even thinking about it makes me hate this man from the core of my being. There you go. That's how dirty this man is. That he would actually claim that the mother of our Lord, the pure virgin vessel of our Lord, will be one of the hooties in paradise married to Muhammad, the six sexual deviant pervert son of the devil. Now, um, tell us what you really think, Sam. Hmm. You want me not get upset that he says that about the mother of my Lord, you know, or the mother of Christ? All right, now, uh, Hatun. Um, so it, it, we, we've established very clearly that Muslim men are allowed to um, have sex with their captives and slave girls, even if they capture women who are still married, they capture the women and the men, uh, even if they want to, they know they're going to sell these women in the next town they reach, they're allowed to go ahead and rape these married women that they're about to sell. And uh, if Muhammad has a slave girl, he's obviously allowed to have sex with his slave girl whenever he wants, even in the, the bed of his, his own wife. And if she gets upset about that, well, that's her problem. Allah can replace her if she's a bad wife. But uh, he's, Muslim men aren't just allowed to have sex with their captives and slave, and slave girls in, you know, in whatever way they want. It's also, it's also true now, there's a verse of the Quran where Allah says that your wives are your tilth. Tilth is a tilth is a, 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 a patch of land that you plow in order to plant your seed in it. So uh, what what is the what is the Islamic view of how husbands should view their wives here? Um, I think you are talking about Surah 2, 223, mm -hmm. where um, Allah with all of his wisdom shows mercy to husband and then orders husband to go to his wife however and whenever he wants. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know I am in the presence of my brothers but uh, sadly when you kind of think more practically that means woman cannot give any excuse that she doesn't want to have sex it is up to man man says i want to have sex with you this way right now she has to uh she has to follow that order actually she doesn't even have to follow man just go for it mm -hmm. um background background of um hadith is talking about woman doesn't want to have sex in a certain way Allah steps in and then says, oh, who cares what she wants? You so just this, go so, for it whenever, however so, you want. So this was actually a, um, this is in, there's there's multiple hadiths on this, but uh, one of the hadiths, uh -huh. and I think it's the one you're referring to, is in Sunan Abu Dawud. And it's basically there was a Muslim man and his Muslim wife, and he said, I want to have sex with you in a certain position. Yeah. And then the his wife says, I'm not doing that. I'm not having sex in that position. And so this matter comes before Allah through Muhammad. Hey, this woman doesn't want to have sex with her husband in a certain position. She says, no, you can have sex with me in this way, but not in, in that way. And then Allah responds, what are you talking about? She's your tilth. She's your land for plowing. Plow her however you want. That's that's basically what, what the verse says. Yeah. Do you want me to shock them even more, David? Uh-oh. You sure? No, go ahead. Okay, now, okay, this is from Ibn Kathir. Now, Ibn Kathir is going to quote some scholars, and then he's going to try to <clears throat> weaken their statements or claim their false statements. Guys, get ready now. I know this is for mature audiences, but this is the problem when you're dealing with Islam. This is Ibn Kathir's exposition of chapter 2, verse 223. If you want to know the verse, chapter 2, verse 223. <clears throat> Let me read just slowly what he says here. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, boy. All right. Question, uh, quoting Jabir ibn Abu Hatim, the Jew said to Muslims, if one has sexual intercourse with his wife from behind, she will deliver a squint-eyed child. Okay. However, their statement is refuted when Allah revealed, your wives are tilth unto you, so go to your tilth when or how you will. Ibn uh, Jari said concerning this hadith that the Prophet said, from the front or from the back, from from the back as long as it is in the and i'm sorry i'm repeating the vagina now watch this guys watch this guys 
There are also several ahadith on how to have sex with one's wife as long as it is from the vag vagina. However, it is forbidden to have sex with one's wife in the anus. This is a like Ibn Kathir. But even with that said, now look what he goes on to say. Okay, It was narrated on the authority of Ub Ibn Umar, Malik, a Shafi, notice the names, and a Tahawi, that it is lawful. What is lawful? There are reports attributed to these men. You can have sex with your wife in the anus, but it is untrue. And Nasir al-Sabah said, Rabbi used to swear by Allah that Ibn Abdul Hakam had lied. So this Muslim lied when he had made allegations against a Shafi concerning the lawfulness of having sex with one's wife in the anus. Oh my goodness. Guys, I'm ashamed to even repeat it, but I want you to see how disgusting it is. Here are Muslims fighting each other, debating each other, whether there are sound narrations saying, Muslim, have sex with your wives in the anus or only in the vagina. Tell me what kind of filthy, sick, perverted religion this is that they are occupying themselves with whether chapter 2 verse 223 says, I can have wife with my wife in the anus or in the vagina only. I mean, this is Islam, the religion of Allah, and it's holy and pure, and Muhammad is a holy prophet, an example for mankind. There you have it. That's Islam for you. Um, and, and just so everyone understands what, what we're saying here, um, Surah 2, verse 223, your wives are a tilth to you, so approach your tilth when or how you will, right? So a tilth, again, a, a patch of land that you plow to sow your seed. So when it says, hey, you, you approach your tilth, that's your patch of land, you plow it however you want. There were Muslims who took this to mean that uh, you can have that Allah allows you to have anal sex with your wife, and that's that's perfectly acceptable uh, and encouraged by Allah. And there were other Muslims who said, "No, uh, this isn't talking about that. This doesn't mean any way you want. It only means any way you want. That's that's still okay." And there's actually a dispute in the Muslim community uh, over how how much Allah is allowing you to do to your wife here. And notice. It doesn't matter what the what the wife's objection is. It doesn't matter if the wife, I don't want to do that. It doesn't matter. This is not saying, hey, you know, if your wife agrees, you know, do anything your wife agrees to. This is saying it doesn't matter what she agrees to. She's your tilth, not vice versa. So this is, uh, this is Islam. Now, Hatun, there are obviously going to be men who have wives who disagree with them. And there are going to be wives who get upset. What are you doing? You're, you're, you have all these extra wives you have these slave girls you're making us do all kinds of stuff that we don't want to do and you know allah says it's all okay um what's going on here I, i'm gonna rebel against you now if, uh, I, well, if, if you are if you are gonna rebel against me then i will beat you with my handkerchief <laughs> or with my toothbrush um or I could simply call police and put you in prison. But uh, no, so um, if that is happens when husband fears that wife is going to be disobedient, when wife says, oh, actually, no, I don't want to have sex with you in that way. Or when he fears that she might be saying that husband, Allah gives divine order that husband can beat the wife. And um, I made a joke of um, handkerchief or toothbrush, but no, we are not talking about handkerchief or toothbrush. We are talking um, about the objects, objects which can even leave the signs on her body. So, um, therefore, um, I am afraid as a wife, you are just like another object. Uh, I can, I can just beat you. Nothing personal in that, but that's how it is. Surah four verse 34 and then you've got lots of hadith simply sports that but that's showing love to you hatun what's wrong with you that's how he's showing love come yeah, on yeah yeah i did i did listen a couple of uh, muslim female scholars um that husband if husband is not beating you that means he doesn't <laughs> love you so okay. but i am looking i am looking at the christian scripture and i am seeing the marriage my lord proposes amen where that marriage is like it's a couple who is dancing one of them both of them are responding each other and their intention is just loving one another pleasing one another it is not it's not all about me 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 and my desire islam comes and then introduce 
I think very disturbing and ugly version of marriage, um, not acceptable at all. But people are quite okay about it. I met with woman who tried to justify why her husband was beating her. She's been in hospitals. Um, why she can't even get divorced because Allah says it's okay. And I, I even actually, I haven't watched the video, but there is a clip. Um, Turkish scholar is talking about if your husband beats you. Uh, when you after like you got beaten stuff after uh, when you bring the tea late in the evening just kindly ask your husband what did I do yet in one sense Islam doesn't even say oh man needs to explain or give any reasons why he's beating his wife but that's how it is so if you if wife is not happy that husband is sleeping around if wife is not happy that husband um, is kind of today's term raping her raping her ra uh, then simply she gets beaten mm -hmm. wonderful yeah now uh let, let me go ahead and read let me go ahead and read uh surah 4 verse 34 and uh, sam hatun uh, hatun gave us some alternative muslim explanations of this oh. verse that this simply refers to Hanky hitting her with a toothbrush or a handkerchief. I've also seen, you know, uh, 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 some some a patch of grass. You 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 take some high grass and you you know you uh, just tap her with the uh, with the grass. Um, yeah. But the, here we have the verse: Men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one of them to excel the other, and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah has guarded. As for those from whom you fear rebellion. You got three steps here. Admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Then if they obey you, seek not a way against them. Lo, Allah is ever high, exalted, great. So it's if they obey you, seek not a way against them. But until they obey you, uh, you can, you know, you can warn them, you can banish them to a separate bed and you can scourge them. Now, on, on the face of it, the idea that this simply refers to tapping lightly with a toothbrush or something like that. It, it, it's sort of like okay, you're you're worried that your wife is going to rebel against you. So first, you're gonna you're gonna warn her. Hey, woman, you better not disobey me when I say I want to do this and I want to do this sexual position with you. You better not you better not disobey me. And so you warn her at first. Then you banish her to a separate bed. And I, I've seen Muslim commentaries where this is actually like tying them to a bed and so on. But let's just let's just suppose it's separating from the woman and. Uh, you're going to go to a separate bed. And then if that doesn't work, if that if war you warned them, that didn't work. You separated from them, that didn't work. Making them sleep in a different bed to show how displeased you are. If that doesn't work, then you've got the last straw. The last straw. This is the final lesson. Going to huh. tap you with a handkerchief. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. make any sense, ladies and gentlemen. That, that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. It looks like it looks really looks like the final stage is exactly what it's talking about here. You beat them until they obey you. Now, Sam, do we know yes. from from Islam's most trusted sources that this yep. is actually talking about physically beating women into obedience yep. and submission to you? And it's good they asked me the question because the Muslim just said in the comment section, daraba means lightly beat them. Daraba. <laughs> So that's good timing. Glory to God, good timing. Now I'm going to just read Sal Bukhari, Sal Bukhari, volume 7, number 715, in an old classification. Then I'm going to read expositions on why the passage was sent down. Why was it revealed? Here you go. <clears throat> Narrated Ikrama. This is from Sal Bukhari, volume 7, number 715. Narrated Ikrama. Rifa divorced his wife, whereupon Abdul Rahman bin Az Zubair al Qurayzi married her. Say that five times fast. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil. So she had a green veil and complaining to her Aisha of her husband. So she was complaining to Aisha about her husband and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by beating. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's apostle came, Aisha said, guys, pay attention to what Muhammad's child bride said. Because Muslims say, well, Muhammad honored women, dignified them, gave them honor that was unknown prior to his coming. Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. Green veil and the, the spot is even greener than her green veil. Oh, and I have not seen on, any woman suffering. Yeah, yeah. On, on that, before you go on with the Hadith, Sam, 
Because as, as you just pointed out, we hear all the time from Muslims, from Muslims, how Muhammad came to honor women and Islam honors women and so on. But you're telling me, you're telling me with a straight face and reading the source directly out of Sahih al-Bukhari, that Aisha herself said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women, i.e. Muslim women. So th wait a minute. This is Aisha, who, according to the Quran, is given the title, the mother of the faithful, saying, I've seen Muslim women, I've seen Jewish women, I've seen pagan women, but I have not seen one single Jewish or pagan or otherwise non-Muslim woman who suffers as much as Muslim women whose husbands are beating them until their skin turns green. This is from the mother of the faithful who yep. grew up in the purest Islamic atmosphere there was. She learned Islam from Muhammad himself. And you're telling me yeah. with a straight face here yes. that the mother of the faithful said that Muslim women were treated far more horribly than non-Muslim women were to such an extent that she could say, I haven't seen one non-Muslim woman who gets treated like this by her husbands. You're telling me that that this is what Aisha said when Muslims today tell us that, that Muhammad came to liberate and free women and give them all these rights? The only way you can deny this is to say Bukhari is inauthentic. But if you say that, you're no longer Sunni Muslim. Bye-bye. So if you're going to go by the Sunni <clears throat> tradition, Sahil Bukhari, number 715 of volume 7. You don't get more authentic than this. But there's going to be follow-up too, David. Don't forget the historical context, mm -hmm. which we're going to get to. But I want people to see what Muhammad did not do. Now, let's say, okay, David, you know what? But that didn't mean Muhammad justified what he did. Because surely the prophet of mercy, a mercy for all mankind, all creatures, would have rebuked us when saying, hey, damn you, why did you do that? Where is your toothbrush? Your miswak. It's supposed to be with your miswak. That's obviously what he's, that's obviously what Muhammad is about to do in this story. That's obviously because that's why Aisha's coming to him, right? Aisha comes and says, exactly. Muhammad, have you seen how Muslim men are treating their wives? They're beating them until their skin turns green. It's a hor It's like a horror movie, what these husbands are doing to their wives who won't obey them and do weird stuff in all these weird positions with all these different holes and stuff like that. They won't listen to their wives. I mean, their wives won't listen to their husbands and the husbands are just beating them until their skin turns green. My goodness, that's why I need to come to you, oh beloved prophet. You need to fix this mess that you've created by telling, by telling men that they can beat their wives into submission. You've caused endless horror and pain for women. I'm showing you, I'm putting the evidence before your eyes. Here you go, look at this woman whose skin is greener than her clothes than the green dress she's wearing. Look at this woman. Look what your teachings of your God have done to this woman. I want you to set this straight. Obviously, Muhammad is about to crush this man. Have him beaten, have him beaten until his, his skin turns green. Eye for eye, that's what Muhammad's gonna do. Give it to us, Sam. Absolutely not. When Abdurrahman heard that his wife had gone to the Prophet, he came with his two sons from another wife. She said, by Allah, I have done no wrong to him, but he's impotent. He's useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. Can't, you know, satisfy me. Abdurrahman said, by Allah, O Allah's apostle, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she's a disobedient. And wants to go back to Rifa. Now watch, Muhammad's gonna get angry at the husband. Shame on you, damn you! Let's see what he says. Allah's apostle said to her, If that is your intention, then know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Rifa unless Abdurrahman has had sexual intercourse with you. And we gotta talk about that a little later. Then the Prophet saw two boys with Abdurrahman and asked him, Are these your sons? On that, Abdurrahman said, Yes. The Prophet said, You claim, now he's rebuking the wife. You claim what you claim, that he's impotent, but by Allah, these boys resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. Notice he rebukes her for falsely accusing him of being impotent. Doesn't say a darn thing about him beating her so green that it was greener than her green veil. That's a prophet of mercy, David. So hold on. You're, you're telling me that when this woman is brought to Muhammad, with her skin greener than her clothes. Why? Because her husband was simply following what Allah said in the Quran. And Muhammad must not have told his followers that this is just supposed to be 
a handkerchief, or a toothbrush. He actually beat his wife until her skin was greener than her clothes. And Muhammad's response was, well, you're not a good wife because you're talking trash about him. And therefore, <laughs> carry on, carry on. And not, not, not only that, not only that, notice, notice how he, he catches her here, right? So he, so she married one man and then they, they were divorced. And then she married another man who's beating her until her skin turns green. And she's going around in order to cause uh, trouble for them because she wants to go back and marry the original dude. She wants to go back and marry the original dude. And so in order to make her husband unhappy with her and get him to divorce her, she says, she goes around saying, he's impotent. My husband is impotent, right? So he's mad that she's calling him impotent. So he beats her until her skin turns green. But then Muhammad catches her and he points out, well, guess what? If you're doing this because you want to go back to your, your old husband and your your accusation against your new husband is that he's impotent, well, guess what? You can't go back to your old husband because in Islam, you can't go back to your original husband until you've had sex with your new husband. And you're saying that your new husband is impotent. So guess what? You're stuck with this man beating you till your skin turns green for the, for the rest of your life because you're calling him impotent. You're caught. You can't. You can't marry the original guy. You've just. You've just told me he's impotent. So too bad for you. Good luck with your green skin. You'll be the She-Hulk eventually. Yeah, you gotta. Yeah. And by the way, David, it's not an isolated incident. To confirm, this verse does not say light beating with a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you now asbab al nuzul. For those of you who know Arabic, asbab al nuzul means the occasion of revelation. Why this was sent down by Ali ibn Ahmed al Wahdi. The Wahdi. Okay, now watch the reason why it was revealed, folks. Nothing in the occasional revelation says that this was sent down to say, beat them with a toothbrush and beat them like, tap them. Tap, right? Okay, let's read. Here goes. Men are in charge of women, said Muqattal, Muqattal, one of the earliest commentators on the Quran. This verse was revealed about uh, Sa'ad ibn al-Rabbi, who is one of the leaders of the helpers, Nuqaba, and his wife Habiba bint Zayed, Maybe <clears throat> Abi Zuhair, boy, these names, both of whom were from the helpers, meaning Ansari from Medina. Now watch this, David and Hatun and everyone else. It happened, Saad hit his wife on the face because she rebelled against him. How many times I heard a Muslim, you're not to hit her in the face, but hit her on the arm with a toothbrush. Hmm, interesting. Then he, her father went with her to see the prophet. He said to him, I gave him my daughter in marriage and he slapped her. The prophet said, let her have retaliation against her husband. So he's saying, okay, eye for an eye. So far, it sounds, seems like Muhammad is merciful. But watch here. As she was leaving with her father to execute retaliation, the prophet called them and said, come back. Gabriel has come to me. And Allah exalted as he revealed the verse. The messenger of Allah said, we wanted something while Allah wanted something else, and that which Allah wants is good, retaliation was then suspended. Oh, wow. Wait, wait, wait. Muhammad said, okay, eye for an eye. Go slap him back. Then Gabriel says, wait, Muhammad. Verses come down. Allah says, no, 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 no. The husband can slap her in the face, and she's supposed to accept it. There is no retaliation for her. Now, let me just finish, because there's another incident mentioned. Uh, uh, Sayyid bin Muhammad bin Ahmad al-Zahid informed us. Zahir ibn Ahmed, Ahmed ibn al Hussein, ibn Junaid, Ziyad ibn Ayyub, Hushaym, Yunus ibn al Hassan reported that a man slapped his wife. Hey, dude, where's your toothbrush? What's wrong with you, dude? Toothbrush, Colgate, scope. Anyway, that a man slapped his wife and she complained about him to the Prophet. Her family who went with her said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, so and so has slapped our girl. The prophet kept saying, retaliation, retaliation. And there is no other judgment to be held. But then this verse, men are in charge of women. Chapter 4, verse 34, was revealed. And the prophet said, we wanted something, and Allah wanted something else. Abu Bakr al-Harithi informed us. Abu al-Sheikh al-Hafiz. Abu Yahya al-Razi. Sahal al-Askari. Ali ibn Hashim. Ismail al-Hassan, who said, around the time when the verse on retaliation was revealed amongst us, eye for an eye, the, to the Muslims, a man has slapped his wife. She went to the prophet and said, my husband has slapped me and I want retaliation. So he said, let there be retaliation. As he was still dealing with her, 
Allah exalted as he revealed men are in charge of women because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other upon which the prophet said we wanted something and my Lord wanted something different oh man take her off by the hand now get, David and Hatun did you notice three different stories given to say that when a man slapped his wife slapped in the face Muhammad said get retaliation eye for an eye and then it says the verse came down saying no there is no retaliation for a man slapping his wife in the face but David I thought they said this verse means take a toothbrush and hit her on the shoulder or in the hand lightly mm -hmm. what's going on yeah um, this I think goes back to you know who you know who really has the answer for this Sheikh Yasser Qadi, and I don't mean for for wife beating. I mean for what goes what goes on here. Remember when he's talking about the holes in the narrative, and uh, this is just to tie it into how we started with the with Hatu, with the video of Hatu. Um, but Yasser Qadi points out that you know at first Muslims haven't heard anything about the Ahruf and Kirat. They don't know what's going on, right? And then when they first start looking into this, they're like, "Whoa, what is this?" But then if they look a little deeper, then they just sort of mindlessly accept what their what their leaders tell them. And they just regurgitate that. And then if they press forward, then they realize the problems that they have. But this is kind of true in all of these areas, the same thing, right? Like at first, your average Muslim, he's, he, he, you know, your average Muslim growing up in America, he's never heard anything about beating wives into submission. He hasn't read that. He doesn't read the Quran. And so he doesn't know that this is there. All of a sudden, he hears that Islam allows beating women into submission. He hears it from us. He doesn't hear it from his leaders. His leaders are quiet about that, right? So he hears it from us. And then he's like, uh-oh. Oh, they said it's Surah 4, verse 34. I'm reading it. Up, oh, up. Oh, there it is. Oh, no. What is this? I've got an emergency. And then they go to their leaders, and their leaders say, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but it, you know, in Arabic, it refers to just a, a light beating that wouldn't hurt her. Yeah, and it just means, you know, you, you, you rub a, a handkerchief on her. And it just, it just, you know, means tapping her with a toothbrush. And then the Muslim says, oh, you see that? Now the, now the problem is solved. And now, you, now we bring up the issue and they say, oh, but, you know, it, it's just light, light beating with a toothbrush. And they, re, they repeat what their leaders have told them not realizing that if they dig a, just a little bit deeper, they come up with the sources that we're quoting would show women getting hit in the face, women being beaten until their skin turned green. Aisha saying that Muslim women were treated worse than the pagan women. That's what they come up with. And so as Yasser Qadi pointed out, once you dig a little deeper, you find out, nope, those, those answers that you memorized and regurgitated, they don't actually work. So I guess the overarching question is, why are Muslim leaders constantly feeding lies to Muslims in order to calm them down from the stuff they're learning? Uh, it's, uh, it's bad. It's bad. Islam is, Islam is just leaking all over the place, and the leaders are trying to, to, trying to plug everything up, and it's just, uh, it's just not working. Um, Hatun, any final thoughts on the issue of beating women as the only, as the only, uh, as the only woman here? Um, if, any final thoughts on this before we move on? So you mean if I have any experiences on that? Uh, um... <laughs> I, I, I actually, yeah. um, hey, as the only woman who gets constantly roughed up by Muslim men, <laughs> as the only woman here who, who gets knocked around and knocked on the ground by Muslim men. <laughs> uh, it, it is disappointing to see how much it has been justified. Like why at the first place Allah even like proposes something like that. Like, I don't know, like in the same story of Hafsa, Allah doesn't turn to Hafsa and then says, oh, I'm so sorry, your husband did this. Do you need any pastoral help? Or in story of the woman who has been beaten by her husband and her skin is greener than her dress. Like, Muhammad doesn't even say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that looks very bad. Buruz, uh, did you try to put toothpaste on it or anything? Like, there is no any love or compassion to woman. Like those people who are married, like you do know marriage, ma being married is very hard work. You have to sacrificially love your husband and your wife. And it is like, it can be tense, difficult. And especially when we are broken people, it becomes more and more difficult. But when creator of universe and man who's supposed to be best example to humanity simply says, yeah, you can simply make your wife's skin color is different, make it blue, make it black. That's absolutely fine. 
giving that justification is already a problem and it is causing people to suffer therefore like I, as i said in the beginning if allah is telling oh yeah husband can beat their wife if husband can beat their wife why what is the reason that they should not beat the um non-believers or the kufars or the critic of islam like once you start proposing such a thing then what do you expect people to walk around with handkerchief and then say oh do you need handkerchief to just um, take your tears away because your husband just bruised you i think i i find it's very disturbing i find it's more disturbing when woman tries to justify it and Muhammad tries to justify it and then says to this woman, yeah, stay with your husband until your husband has sex with you, even though she doesn't want. That means there is like married rape in marriage for a long time for that woman. And she will ha she will be walking around with bruised skin for 24 seven. And there is no one who says, oh, there is a better way. Mm -hmm. And you get to see the same in like, countries where people never heard the alternative they see their father beats their mom they grow up get married they beat their wife their children take the it goes from generation to generation why because allah who has zero mercy allah who has no love tells husband to beat their wife in order to uh, make them submit to them disturbing mm -hmm. now uh hatun uh, we we especially in the West, basically non-Muslims in general, would be wondering, hey, if you have a disagreement with your wife, why wouldn't you simply explain things to her, reason with her, give her some good arguments for why you're right and she's wrong, and guide her to the truth <laughs> and the correct path? Um, why, would you, why would you have to beat her? Like, I mean, you know, like... A, like you know like like you beat a uh, a dog who's not obeying you right i mean why you, uh, for obvious reasons you don't sit down and reason with the dog and say you listen here you shouldn't have peed on that carpet dog i'm gonna break this down i'm gonna give you five reasons why you should not pee on the carpet the dog doesn't understand that so you have to come up with other ways of showing the dog what he's supposed to do why wouldn't you simply appeal to your wife's reasoning ability and show her why do you have to resort to f these physical things like get out of my bed and uh, I'm gonna beat you now why not just show her through evidence and logic and guide her to the truth that way um, so when first of all when it comes to the dogs I've got two dogs right now and you can actually easily train them um, not, yes you don't sit down and then have like breakdown arguments and then ask dog to give you respond but you can simply tell your dog don't do it again and your dog understands and very very clever mm -hmm. even the dogs are very clever not only they are so faithful but they are so clever but when it comes to islam it is difficult because uh they are identified as deficient in mind so therefore it is difficult to sit down and then tell your wife Habibi, I wanted lunch to come here at five o'clock. It didn't come. It's uh, five minutes past five. Uh, let me explain to you. Within that five minutes, I could be doing this, this, this. Now I am behind of my schedule. Uh, and then you simply kind of go to the chart and then give you her new schedule or something. And then she would say yes. But in Islam, actually, no, because she's so deficient. She doesn't even understand that you are late five minutes. So therefore, it affects lots of your things it is um it is heartbreaking but um yes according to um allah they are deficient in mind and the reason for that is like reason is amazing i think uh, i'm sure no one heard the reasoning before because you get your period once a month so that makes you deficient hmm. so therefore no you can't sit down and then go through the arguments and reasoning and then ask your wife to just simply learn and discipline well, uh, a quick quick follow-up here. Um, suppose a woman doesn't understand what she's supposed to do and she's not smart enough because she's intellectually deficient and 
So she decides, hey, I'm going to, you know, my husband keeps beating me and he's beating me into submission. He keeps beating me. So I'm actually going to take him to, to court over this. If a judge were really following the teachings of Islam, how would how would this woman do in court? Uh, not very good, actually. I've got examples. Uh, being beaten is not the reason for you to get divorced. Hmm. So your husband is lovely, faithful husband. Hmm. What like Allah versus your feelings? Who cares about your feelings? Just go and get chocolate, pull yourself together, yeah. and deal deal with that. Hmm. Uh, in England, um, according to British law, you would go to prison and then you would get like lots of orders. But according to Islam, no. There are I know like a woman. She she's beaten. She was in hospital for three months. She went to get divorced and. Uh, they, she was told, actually, you don't have any reason. Why do you want to get divorced? And she's still married. Like, what do you? Hmm. Yeah, Sorry, and, and I, I just, I just wanted to say from personal experience of having uh, dealt with Islam for a while, writing articles, making videos. Um, Muslims send me responses, send me uh, messages defending it, and a lot of times it's denying. What Islam yeah. obviously teaches, it's saying, oh, no, Islam doesn't teach that. But a, a, a lot of different times, it's people defending it and saying, no, it's right. Uh, women are intellectually deficient. Yes, and yes, sometimes they do need to be beaten. And what's disturbing is most of the time it's from women. It's from women who have absorbed yeah. who have absorbed this over the course of their lives. And they're saying, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of course, of course, sometimes our husband has to do this when we get out of line. Uh, of course, we're too emotional and we can't think clearly enough. And so our husbands have to, you know, keep us in line. Of course, a, a man's testimony is more reliable than a woman's testimony. And, and again, this uh, is just sad that Islam has this impact on the world, but it's, yeah, it's women who tend to defend this, uh, these teachings. Yeah. All right, Sam. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Speak. Reason for reason for that is they never seen alternative. Yeah. Like there is no one turned up and then give them the bi uh, biblical description of the marriage or explain them actually it is not allowed. There is a video is um, showing this um, people are uh, leaving Syria and then they want to go to Europe in Turkish border. They are asking these security guards, "Oh, where should we go? Like, can you help us?" The guy says. Don't go to Germany. You can go to prison in Germany because you beat your wife. Go to Canada. Mm -hmm. Just sorry, Sam. All right. No, no. Well, why? Sorry for. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just waiting for you to finish. So make the point. Don't worry. There's yep. no nothing yeah, to be that, sorry. Yeah, that, that 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 was it. Just like when woman tries to justify it. Mm. What, what yeah. are you gonna say to what are you gonna say to her? Like you look into her eyes and then you say, so you seriously don't see there is any problem with that? She says, no, like. Human beings can get used to just about anything and think yeah. that it's uh, think that it's normal. Uh, Sam, what are your what are your thoughts on yeah. this issue? I want to I want to give the chronic and Hadith proof for what you're saying. But there is a related story. There was years ago. Remember AOL where you dial up? It used to be AOL prehistoric time. Some people were not even born mm -hmm. back then. So there's a chat room where I went in and I started quoting verses from the Quran Hadith. And then a Muslim woman contacted me in private, and she goes, why are you doing this? I go, doing what? Talking about Islam. I go, I'm showing you the treatment of Islam, how it treats women. And I go, doesn't it bother you? She honestly said, yes, it bothers me, but what choice do I have seeing that this is the true religion and this is my fate because this is what Allah did. He created me as a woman. So her mind wasn't that Christianity is an option. Christianity is obviously false. Judaism, all these religions are false. Islam is true, and this is the fate my fate because this is what Allah did he created me a woman there was no other alternative in her mind I pray since then she's come to her senses she's given her life to Christ but for those of you who want Quranic support for what Hatun and David said and most of you know this already and Hadithic support support from Muhammad remember these three verses chapter 2 of the Quran verse 228 Surat al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse 228 it says men have a degree higher than woman chapter 2 verse 282 because if you remember David was asking Hatun what if a woman takes a man to court the reason why this was brought up because in chapter 2 verse 282 of the Quran it says that two women equal the testimony of one man 
So going to court, and if you're a woman, going by yourself, no use. Why? Because your testimony is half as good as a man. It takes two women to equal the testimony of one man. So if a woman who's Muslim comes and she takes me to court, that's not good enough. She has to have a second witness to equal my testimony. That's chapter 2, verse 282 of the Quran. And in chapter 4, verse 34, the one passage we read where it says men can beat women, it's because Allah has made men to excel women, to be superior to women, mm -hmm. to be greater to women. Now, with that said, let me read the hadith. Sorry about the phone. I can't reach it, so yeah, but, just keep ringing. These things okay, now let, me, now let me just read what Muhammad said about chapter 2, verse 282. This is Muhammad's exposition, folks. This is Muhammad interpretation of chapter 2 verse 282 where it says two women equal the testimony of one man Sal Bukhari volume 1 number 301 Sal Bukhari volume 1 number 301 narrated Abu Sayyid Al Khudri once Allah's apostle went out to the Musalla to offer prayer on Eid Al Adha or Al Fitr prayer then he passed by the woman and said this is Muhammad then he passed by the woman and said O woman give alms I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire, most people are in hell, were you women. Let me just shut it down. Sorry, yeah, man, because it's not going to stop. Take this. your time. The show has been ruined forever. Thanks, Mommy, Sam. Let me call you back. I'm live streaming. I love you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's my daughter. Cougar. Okay, sorry, guys. Wow, That's my wow, baby. wow. Another All show right. ruined by Sam's phone. Yeah, am I, am I going to have to rebuke my daughter? Right, I'm kidding. All right, now. And now notice what it says here. I have seen, I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligent religion than you. So they're saying, why are we the most people in hell? Here's his response. The reason why most women, most people in hell are women. I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, deficient in intelligence and, and religion. religion. And he's saying this to women. Yeah, Muslim okay. women who believe in him as a messenger. Wow. And he's a mercy to all creation. Even to and the Muslim goes, women. Okay, good. Yep. A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you. The woman asks all as apostle, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? Now notice the circular reasoning. He said, is it not the evidence of two women? Is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? They replied in the affirmative. Talk about brain, brain dead zombies. They're saying, yes. Well, hold on, women. Where'd you get that from? Oh, the Quran. The Quran in chapter 2, verse 282 says, two women equals the testimony of one man. So they go, yeah. But why? Because the Quran said so. But who cares what the Quran says? Well, because they believe that's the word of Allah. So if Allah said it, then yes, messenger, you're right. Notice the circular reasoning here. Then what about their religion? <clears throat> he said, is not the evidence of two men equal to the witness of one man? They are in the affirmative. He said, this is deficiency in her intelligence. Isn't it true? Now watch this, folks. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses? The one replied in the affirmative. He said, this is the deficiency in your religion. So you see that, David? Because women have the misfortune of having periods that makes them deficient in religion because that prohibits them from praying and fasting. Darn you, women. Darn you, women. Shame on shame on you, Hatan, Hatun. <laughs> shame on you. Don't, I, don't you think it's amazing that while Muslim women can't even pray and fast because they have their periods versus as a Christian woman? I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus once for all. I can pray and fast, even I am having my period. I think that's just like beauty of Christian faith. Yep, yep. Yeah, so um, now, uh, sort of moving on to the next topic. Um, Hatun, you, you mentioned that a lot, of, a lot of women in Islam will defend this stuff because they've never known anything else they've never seen any alternative but lots of times if you're if you're marrying a woman if you're marrying an adult woman she may have seen a lot of alternatives and so you you might want to be careful it's, it seems like if you if you want to teach these things if you want to teach a woman hey i can marry you and i can marry three others and i can just keep on divorcing and keep on marrying and i can have uh, sex slaves, and if you get out of line, I can beat you into submission, and I can, you know, I, you know, I could go out into battle and take these take these women and girls as as sex slaves. If you want to do this, and it's a woman who has been exposed to other ways of doing things, 
a lot of women in the world will say, no, what? Like, if you were to tell a woman in the West, hey, I'm going to marry you, and oh, by the way, I'm going to marry three women after you, and there's nothing you can do about it because that's my religion. Most women in the, Mexico, in the West are going to say, what? What are you talking about? No way. Not happening, right? So it seems, Hatun, it seems to me that your best bet for really getting these teachings into your wife without her objecting, without her being familiar with any other way of doing things, would be to get her when she's really, really young. That's all. That's that's yeah. all I can think. So, is that the route Muhammad went, or is that forbidden? Is that sort of thing forbidden in Islam? Oh well, uh, once you meet with children, they don't know that much. They never seen alternative. Yes, as you said, adults have seen alternatives. They heard alternatives, but those poor children, all they did was playing on the swings or playing with the dolls. Yes, you go and get them because they never seen alternatives. They are fresh meat. Uh, and yeah, Mohammed practiced and then so it works. It works. Therefore, he picked a girl called Aisha and decided to marry with this child. So that child never seen alternative. Therefore, she was quite happily married. Therefore, Muslims would say like she never ever complain about her marriage. Because she never seen alternative. Is that the one you are talking about, David? Yeah, that's, lovely, that's lovely the one. child. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one. Um, it it occurred to me that if you really and wanted to, here. if you really wanted someone to buy into all this, you'd have to you'd have to catch her when she's real young. Or if she's an adult, you just have to give your give her husband permission to beat her anytime she objects to anything. And so. Islam seems to do exactly what is required to get women and girls to accept this horrible, horrible, horrible treatment that they're subject to in Islam. Islam seems to, to do whatever is necessary. Now, now Sam, um, yes. when we bring up the issue of Muhammad and Aisha, Muhammad marrying a girl too young for a bra, mm -hmm. Muhammad marrying and having sex with a girl, uh, before she reached the age where she would need a bra. Married her when she was six or seven and then consummated the marriage, had sex with her when she was nine years old. Now, our, our Muslim apologist... Now, what's interesting here is you have people like Shabir Ali now. I actually have Shabir on video saying that a girl of nine years old just isn't ready for marriage. She's not ready for marriage and so he's actually condemning most of the people we would interact with but most of the people we would interact with uh, on this issue would actually defend it they would say that aisha was ready for marriage because she had reached the age of puberty she had reached puberty and that's when muhammad said okay now i can go ahead and climb on top of her even though she's nine years old she's a grown woman according to islam because she's reached puberty Mm -hmm. Do you believe that these Muslims are correct based on what the Muslim sources say? Absolutely not. We've done this so many times, and again, we have to repeat it like broken records. First of all, the Quran itself allows Muslim men to marry girls who are prepubescent. Chapter 65, verse 4 of the Quran. This is going to be relevant because Bukhari will use Aisha as an example of this. Bukhari will use Aisha as an example of this passage. What does it say? I'm going to read Halali Khan. I and mean, we can read any translation, but Halali Khan. And those of your women as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them, the idda, the waiting, waiting period, if you have doubts about their periods, is three months. And for those who have no courses, i.e., this is their comments, they are still immature. Their idda waiting period is three months, likewise, except in the case of death. And for those who are pregnant, whether they are divorced or their husbands are dead, their idda waiting period, prescribed period, is until they deliver their burdens. Well, and whosoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him, he will make his matter easy for him. Now, folks, if you don't understand what the saying is, Muslims came up to Muhammad asking, okay, uh, you know, you, you told us about divorce. When we divorce our wives, there's a period of time before they can remarry. So if a Muslim woman gets divorced, she has to wait three months, three month, monthly cycles. So they brought up some good questions. What uh, Muhammad, some of our wives are menopause. They don't have periods. And some of our wives 
are young girls, immature, premature. They, even, they haven't even had their periods yet. What about them, Muhammad? So what did Muhammad not say? Remember, Muhammad is supposedly a mercy unto mankind. Muhammad should have said, what are you talking about? You are actually married and having sex with a minor? A premature, immature minor? What are you talking about? I'm a mercy unto mankind. How dare you? You know what he said? He goes, in the case of those young girls who are immature, premature, who haven't had their monthly courses, their waiting period is three months. Now, David and I know this, and Hatun knows this. In Islam, chapter 33, verse 49. Chapter 33, verse 49. Write this down, folks. And David has the videos on this. The verse I was referring to is chapter 65, verse 4. But in chapter 33, verse 49, it says, If I have contracted marriage to a woman, but I haven't touched her sexually, there is no waiting period. Now, David, again, I'm not the smartest guy. You know that. Mm hmm if the Quran says, if I'm engaged to a woman, but I haven't touched her sexually, there's no waiting period. What is the implication of 65 verse 4 when it says, for those girls who haven't had their periods because they're premature, immature, too young, their waiting period is three months before they can remarry. What does that mean? What does that imply? It means their husbands have had sex with them, even though they're prepubescent. Are you kidding me, man? You mean grown men mm -hmm. having sex with minors and doesn't even give you the age. I have an article called Islam, the Religion of Pedophilia. I quote Muslim scholars. It's on Answering Islam, uh, the Answering Islam blog .wordpress com. Do you know what the Muslim scholars say? There is no age limit. There is no set age that <clears throat> will, will qualify or justify a man marrying a woman. doesn't say she's got to be 12. There's only one condition, and I got to begin. It's a mature audience, but anyway, I'm going to try to keep it G-rated. Here's the condition. You, you, this you, is Muslim you, scholars. You, you're not going to get G-rated, but we'll go for PG. Okay, PG. PG or PG-13. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, PG. Yeah, you're right, PG-13. This, this is the Muslim condition. There's only one condition. It's not the age. They, they admit there is no age, age limit in Islam for a young girl to be married off. Technically, she can be three. I'm not exaggerating, but what's the condition? The condition is she can handle penetration. That's the condition. The condition is she can handle penetration. Now, what about Aisha? Was she, uh, had she reached puberty or was she prepubescent? Well, here, you don't need to guess. Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim, book eight, number 3311. Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old. There's a difference. Some say six or seven. Remember, it's lunar, so it's, it's around the same age. And she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine, and her dolls were with her. And when he died, she was 18 years old. So notice, what did she do? She was taken to his house for him to consummate marriage when she was playing with dolls. If you don't know why that's significant, the Quran and well, not Quran so much, but the Islamic tradition condemns images having dolls. But according to Ibn Hajar al Askalani in his commentary on Bukhari, Fath al Bari, he says the reason why Aisha was allowed to play with dolls, an exception, because you can't play with dolls, it's forbidden, images are forbidden, is because she hadn't reached puberty. And so Muhammad made an exception for pre-bubescent girls. If a girl hasn't reached puberty, she can play with dolls. So here's proof Aisha was still immature, hadn't reached puberty because she was playing with dolls. Because if she was pubescent, she would be condemned for playing with dolls. So there you have it, David. Mm -hmm. Very, very disturbing stuff. And so, um, sort of putting all of this together, um, according to Islam, again, said this repeatedly, but uh, we're talking about what Islam teaches here. Don't think that if you have a Muslim friend, your Muslim friend agrees with this stuff. Your average Muslim, especially in the West, hasn't isn't familiar with these things and would be horrified at these things. And that's why when you tell them, hey, your prophet, your prophet allows men to beat their wives into submission, that Muslim then runs to his leader who says, oh, please help me, help me. I, I can't accept that a man can beat his wife until her skin turns gray. I can't accept that. So what's the solution here? And that's why his Muslim leader who lies to him says, no, 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 just tapping with a toothbrush. Don't believe these Christians who are quoting your prophet. Don't believe them. 
believe me. That's what we do. We mindlessly believe me and we don't follow what our sources actually say. But you can beat women into submission. Uh, women are your tilth, which again is revealed in the context of a woman refusing to have sex in a certain position. Allah says, what are you talking about? Go for it. Uh, women are stupid and immoral by nature. That's why you beat them into submission rather than reasoning with them. Uh, you can swear an oath to your wives and then uh, break the oath if you, you know, if, if it didn't come from Allah. Um, you can have, you can marry prepubescent girls. You can marry prostitutes. Give them some money. Just marry them for the duration of your sexathon with them. You have uh, raping of female captives and slave girls. And if you get caught having sex with, you know, your slave girl in your wife's bed, just threaten to divorce your wife if she gets upset about any of this. So this is what we find in the Muslim sources. We have a, a little over 10 minutes left. Uh, Hatun, why don't you give us uh, your final thoughts on the situation with women in Islam, and then we'll probably take some questions for the remainder. Um, Islam steps in around, uh, Islam steps into history around 7th century and takes away all the value and dignity of woman and uses Muhammad kind of uses Allah to justify all those things. And one of the essential thing is, as David said, lots of Muslims are not aware of that. And once they hear, some of them try to justify, but some of them doesn't want to do anything about it. And according to Christian scripture, we are the people who are made in image of God. God loves us. God cares for us. He gave his one and only son for us. When we kind of look at the, what Islam teaches about women, it's like, for me, it's simply run away as fast as you can from Islam because ideology is there to degrade, degrade you. Ideology is there to take away your value and dignity. And this ideology can be destroyed only by the teachings of Jesus, only Jesus himself can destroy that because those people never seen alternative they never heard the alternative i'm not talking about those ones who has easy access to check google but most of people are really not aware of it and um if you are watching and if you are beloved ones who knows our glorious gospel i just simply encourage you just take those references go and ask your muslim friend with knowing those things, what keeps you heard there? Because it is not like, yes, we are talking about for women, but actually it is very dangerous ideology to humanity as well. So uh, keep away from Islam, run away from Islam as soon as, as, as fast as you can. As you do so, please, please give them the alternative of our risen Lord. And... Um... Sam, she makes a she makes an interesting point there about Islam oh. degrading women, but that's what it really that's what Islam seems like, right? Like in Christianity, human beings are created in the image of God. We're children of God who are encouraged to become children of God in a higher sense, sons and daughters of the Almighty through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Islam just seems like it's meant to degrade the image of God within us, uh, to keep us away from that relationship we can have with the Almighty. And you look at the impact it has on women, it's beating them, it's reducing them to yeah. sexual servitude, to your master and so on. Uh, but even with, the, even with the men, even with the men, um, look at what Islam, look at what Islam does. All non-Muslims, all non-Muslims are, according to the Quran, the worst of creatures were lower than pigs, according to Islam. So we're obviously degraded, but even Muslim, so we're non-Muslims are obviously degraded and women are obviously degraded. So that basically leaves Muslim men. But what does Islam do? It, it, it tries to turn you into someone who is obsessed with deflowering virgins for all eternity. Like that's what your goal in life is. Your goal is is to be so obedient to Allah that you make it to Jannah where you get to spend eternity deflowering virgins. 
That's what Islam, that's Islam's impact on people. And again, to be clear, most Muslims live better lives than this. Most Muslims Amen. live far better lives than their prophet did. We're talking about what the religion teaches here. But look at what the, the actual goal of the religion, I'd say, seems demonic. It seems to be de to degrade your true status before the Almighty. And that's how it seems to me. Sam, what are your thoughts? And then we'll yeah. take a couple questions. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, me, uh, there's one question I want to get to. Someone just accused us of uh, running from Asidal. This guy's probably been in cave. Just to contrast it with beauty of the Gospels and the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Not only in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. Guys, just note these verses down. I want you to note these verses down. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. And this comes from the Apostle Paul because, ironically, the Apostle Paul is vilified said to be a false false teacher who perverted the message of Jesus and that somehow Muhammad is a moral example <clears throat> and that Paul pales in comparison. And I want to challenge any Muslim. Take, up us, take us up on this challenge. Contrast Paul versus Muhammad. You will find that Muhammad is not worthy to lick the sandals of Paul and Paul is nothing more but a slave of Jesus Christ. But now that said, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5, Galatians 3, verse 28, 28, verse 28. Two of many passages. There you're going to read, Paul talks about the rights of husbands and wives. And he says, if a man is not able to control himself, because that's not his gifting to be celibate. He didn't say go and rape a married captive woman, go and rape a captive woman. Or go prostitute a woman, treat her like a whore, and give her money when you're done gratifying yourself. He says, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. Here's the beauty, the equity, the, the equality. Just like each woman can only have one husband, each man can only have one wife. It's reciprocal. But then he says something astonishing, and I challenge all you Muslims, and how to fix a mushrik 101. Instead of barking, take me up on the challenge. <clears throat> Show me a passage in the Quran that says the following. A uh, wife's body is not hers, it's her husband's. And likewise, the husband's body is not his, it's his wife's. She has full ownership over his body like he has full ownership over the wife's body, the equality again. And that's why he says, neither party can deny the other their conjugal rights except by mutual consent. I challenge you, especially how to fix <clears throat> Mushrik 101. Give me something close to that in the Quran. You won't find it. And then just to put the icing on the cake, Galatians 3 verse 28. Galatians 3 verse 28. Paul says, Paul who's much better than Muhammad. Muhammad is not worthy to kiss the sandals of Paul. He's under the feet of Paul and Paul is nothing more than a slave of Jesus. Galatians 3 28. This is what he says by inspiration of the Spirit of Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither free nor slave, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. You pagans who think that you are monotheists, who smooch a black stone like your immoral prophet did, show me something similar in your Quran and Hadith. You won't find it because Muhammad is an antichrist, a son of Satan, destroyed by the grace of Jesus Christ under the feet of Paul, the slave of Jesus Christ. So that's all I got to say. All right, let's go ahead and take some comments, and then we'll uh, we'll close out. Uh, Sophia Films uh, says, "Long live the lioness of Speaker's Corner." That's right. Take beer. No, I mean I'm just kidding. That's your that's your name, Hatun, lioness of Speaker's yeah, Corner. <laughs> um, and she says, uh, "God bless." Oh, he and uh, God he says, "God bless you, Hatun, Sam, and David." Hatun, please tell the world uh, the types of things the Dawa thugs have done to you. Uh, Christian silence is empowering them. Kyokushin, Karate, Texas, uh, didn't leave a comment. Stephen G said, keep doing your speaking in Speaker's Corner. It almost looks like that country is being taken over by Islam. And Sophia Films also says, Christian men, wake up and protect our sisters. Bruce Bartleson and with the super sticker, LD, didn't leave a comment. Uh, Stephen G said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Galatians 1 8. Paul Georgia says, left a super sticker. Um, K. Scotts with the super sticker. Philippians 2 10 says, you can remove. <laughs> That's just a joke. Uh, Alexandru and David Rodriguez didn't leave comments. Uh, LMCI Muslim 
Islam said, what do Muslims say to supposedly, one second, uh, what do Muslims say to supposedly uh, Old Testament and New Testament, never mentioning Muta and Misyar? Doesn't this prove that the Quran is corrupted and the Old Testament and New Testaments are holy? So yes, um, interesting. Uh, what about the previous revelations? Why don't we find temporary marriage in the Old Testament and New Testament? Uh, if Islam is in, is, is in line with these earlier revelations, the Christian metalhead says the fact that there are people in the world who find Muhammad to be morally superior to the Lord Jesus Christ shows that the hearts of men are truly depraved. God bless you guys. Uh, Corsa Bai said, Huma Yunus, Google her and share her story to bring her home. I beg you all, please. Yeah, she's the um, Is that the Pakistani girl? Yeah, who was, who was, yeah, who was kidnapped in forced marriage? Yeah. yeah, she's pregnant now, so uh, there is no way for her to um, live. Yeah, but when we, uh, when we speak out against these things, um, yeah. we get accused of hate speech. How dare you criticize girls, Christian girls being kidnapped, forced into marriage, impregnated, and then the courts defending the her kidnappers. How dare you do that? Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Joe King says, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for Hatun. I have had Amen. enough with this morally depraved man and his Islamic religion. Talking about Muhammad. Christy C. and Zainab with the... Uh, with these super stickers and uh, Jason Lippert says <laughs> after we're going through the Muslim sources Jason Lippert said I need to go take a shower now <laughs> Manny Manny 650 said David and Hatun need Cokes too that's uh, because uh, Sam was drinking a, a Coke, Coke Zero a Coke Coke Zero. Yeah. Karen Fisher with the super sticker persecuted says uh, hi David How, are you familiar with Annie Cyrus she is from Iran and experiences first hand how Islam treats women. Uh, maybe she would be your guest. Uh, you guys, any of you familiar with uh, Annie Cyrus? I've seen the name, but I haven't uh, I haven't read anything or, or watched anything uh, by her. No, uh, I'm not aware of. Well, I know the singer Cyrus, right? Whatever her name is. Yeah, that's that's, that's you're talking about. Uh, sweet dreams are made of these. <laughs> that one too, yeah. And uh, Ruthie RSRP says, praying, pray for my Muslim close friend. Uh, so that's good if you're uh, sharing with your Muslim friend. Dia Beltran said, I interviewed Robert Spencer. Can I interview you? You'll you'll have to get in line. I've got a, I've got a lot of requests for things. And if I take too many, then I can't make my I can't make my videos for my channel. Uh, and Sophia Film said, every Christian watching, please keep Sam in your prayers for July 29th and the 12th of August. Please Amen. fast and pray Thanks. hard for Sam for these Thank days. You. Mandatory. Amen. Yep, Sam always has a lot of things coming sure. up. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining us again. We have tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a Muslim scholar on with us. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, God, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully hopefully that works out and uh, we won't have any technical problems. But that will be at 9 o'clock because he's calling in from India. And so over there, 8 o'clock for us is like 5 a.m. Okay. Um, and he has his prayer to do. But he said... It is, if we do it at 6, his time, which will be 9 o'clock p.m. here, uh, Eastern Time, he said that it'll actually work because he's already going to be up for his prayer. So he asked to give a 15-minute presentation on Muhammad and on why we should believe in Muhammad. Good. So he's going to give us a 15-minute presentation, and then we're going to have a discussion about his points. Um, Sam and Hatun, their channel... Links to their channels are in the description box, so you can follow them and watch their videos and support them. Uh, Before Sam, you hang up. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna, I was gonna say any any uh, last words for everyone. Yeah, Sam? this only thing because we have a challenge because we have this entire week for Muslim call, calling in. So here, how to fix a Mushrik 101? He just said, what's funny here is that Hatun is the most man enough to debate SC Dawa in the panel. The other two cowards are putrefied. Now, how to fix a Mushrik? I'm gonna call out your bluff. I just debated Ijaz Ahmed and Ibn Anwar with my friend William. It was a five-hour debate. It's on YouTube. And I'm going to be honest, they got slaughtered. They got decimated. I will debate, and David knows this, anyone from SC Dawa, EF Dawa, I'll debate Shabir Ali. I'll even debate your God and Muhammad if Muhammad were to come back to life. Mm. So now here's your chance. This entire week, it's open. Call in and put us little girls in our place. 
Then we'll see who the men are. And then we're going to see who the little girls are who need to run to a black stone and smooch it. But thank the Lord, Hatun, we do need our men to be bold like her because she's a lioness for the glory of Jesus. So there's no denying that. But come and put me in my place. Yeah, and, and here here's what's just amazing and so incredibly delusional about this religion that we've been saying, and we announced it before we ever started, anyone in the world, anyone in the world, 1.6 billion Muslims, anyone who wants to join us live to defend Muhammad, anyone, could be Muhammad Hijab, could be Ali Dawa, could be Brilliant. both of them together, could be Shabir Ali, could be Sheikh Yasser Qadi, could be Zakir Naik himself, could be any of his students, anyone who wants to join us live and have a discussion about Muhammad, that's what we're doing this week. And fortunately, after today, it looks like we've got Muslims lined up for for the entire week. But, dude, I don't know what planet you live on when you when we're sitting here saying we invite all of these people to join us live, and you're sitting here going, "Oh, you're running from them." What 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 color is the sky in your world? Because we don't seem to be on the same planet. All right, Hatun, any final any final thoughts for everyone? Um. I am at Speakers Corner every Sunday, and I never turn up to Speakers Corner with my running shoes. Amen. So, um, if anyone, uh, as I said, I believe uh, Bible is the word of God. I believe in triune God. I believe Jesus is the eternal Son of God who gave His life for humanity on the cross. And if anyone anyone have any objections, I am willing to discuss with intention. I will keep you accountable for what you said. And uh, I don't run because I know the gospel I am given is glorious gospel and it does change the hearts of people and it does take away uh, those women uh, which has been captive under Islam for centuries. Mm. So it has full power. As soon as anyone is willing to engage, we are there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be kind of... I guess it's from my side. All right. Please all right. keep please keep all of us in prayer for the Amen. work that we are doing here. And Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Amen. Nine o'clock PM. We'll have a Muslim scholar on here with us defending Muhammad. We'll see how it goes. Catch y'all later. Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Amen.